They are the fastest, the largest, and the most dangerous in the world. They conquer every terrain, and they overcome borders. This is a very challenging thing to, um, to bring out a new ship like this. But it is much more than a challenge. It's absolutely a privilege to be here and do this. Their design goes beyond the scope of what is technologically possible, setting new standards. These vehicles are milestones of engineering. This is the father of air travel. On land, on water, and in the air. All of them are ultimate vehicles. In this episode, reaching record speeds on giant wheels, the fastest steam locomotive in the world. Of all conventional high-speed trains, it has the most modern drive system, the ICE-4. Also, a luxury hotel on rails. The Japanese Shikishima brings exclusivity to a new level. The mountain climber of trains. This cog railway tackles the world's steepest route and the longest train in the world. Four kilometers of cars, cars, and more cars. This ultimate vehicle is a steel monster, the DR18201. Built for high-speed tests, it is by far the fastest steam locomotive in the world. The express locomotive undertook its first journey on May 31, 1961. Despite its service weight of 172 tons, including tender, it can reach speeds of 180 kilometers an hour. Germany, Sachsen-Anhalt, the former depot in Lutherstadt-Wittenberg. Today, a railroad museum. And the home of the DR18201. It is over 25 meters long. Its wheels have a diameter of 2.3 meters, making them the biggest on German rails. One wheel set alone weighs five and a half tons. Tomorrow, the 18201 will undertake a special journey to Poland. In preparation, engineer Matthias Gerhardt must heat up the engine now, a complicated procedure. Opposed to other steam locomotives which are fired with coal, ours is fired with heavy oil. To make this work, I always need steam from another locomotive or a steam generator to get the engine going, to preheat the boiler, heat up the oil and finally ignite it. For this, he uses a so-called steam coupler. This connection brings the steam at a temperature of 200 degrees Celsius from the active engine to the cold 18201. While the engine heats up, the engineer checks the lubricant containers for the wheels and coupling rods. A total of 30 liters of oil is necessary to keep all the chassis bearings and movable parts running smoothly. Now the old lady has been sufficiently preheated. Matthias Gerhardt is ready to put the engine into operation for the first time since its last trip, several weeks ago. Everything needs to work, but after the locomotive has stood still for a while, sometimes things break. Now is the time when you see if everything is working or not. Matthias Gerhardt starts the fire in the so-called firebox. It is fitted out with special stones as heavy oil burns at temperatures of around 1600 degrees Celsius. The petroleum soaked rag is meant to help start the fire, like using newspaper to light a grill. Now, 
the moment of suspense. Will Matthias Gerhard get the locomotive started? Now I'll move my slide valve to two bar of pressure, then I check everything again, and now we'll see what happens. As soon as the engineer moves the slide valve, the heavy oil is sprayed as a vapor into the firebox and ignited. Matthias Gerhardt looks visibly relieved. It's working. The fire heats the water in the boiler under pressure to almost 200 degrees. Only then is the steam produced to power the engine. The 18201's boiler has a diameter of about 2 meters and is easily accessible from the front. Now we'll check the smoke box. It's obligatory every time after the engine is heated up. This is where combustion gases and exhaust steam from the cylinders accumulate. Both are discharged through the smokestack. This creates a vacuum that keeps the fire going, assuming everything is airtight. As we can see, everything's airtight. Nothing will hold up the journey now. Now the 15,000 litres of water in the boiler have to heat completely, and then the locomotive can drive. a.m. the next morning. Today, 280 passengers plan to travel the 500 kilometers from Leipzig to Poznan, Poland, on the fastest steam locomotive in the world. Together with engineer Peter Weishahn, Matthias Gerhardt will drive the locomotive. Abfahren! The 18201 begins moving effortlessly despite the 500 tons of cars it must pull. In addition to his normal duties driving the train, Matthias Gerhardt must monitor the boiler pressure and keep the fire going. I regulate the oil supply based on the color of the smoke in order to get the best performance. A light to medium grey vapour means the fire is burning as it should. Meanwhile, the 18201 has left the train station and can build up speed. Hi. At 120 km per hour, Matthias Gerhardt and Peter Weishahn drive the locomotive toward Berlin. It's a masterstroke of engineering, considering that the driving mechanism, the wheels and axles are from 1939, is just incredible. With every complete turn of its giant wheels, the locomotive advances 7.22 meters. A great deal of energy is needed to drive the wheels. Thus, the 18201 is designed as a so-called hot steam locomotive. This means that the steam is heated a second time before it goes into the cylinders, thus increasing its energy value. The steam passes through pipes inside the fire tube. There, the heat of the combustion gases doubles the temperature of the steam to about 400 degrees Celsius. Only now is it fed into the three cylinders that drive the steam locomotive's wheels. While the 18201 approaches its first stop, Berlin, at a speed of 120 km an hour, the passengers enjoy the journey in old GDR train cars. After two and a half hours, the train reaches the station in Berlin. Now we'll take on water, check the bearings and see how things are. The locomotive consumed 25,000 litres of water between Leipzig and Berlin. Although every station used to have pumps to refill water, today it is only possible at a few stations that have a hydrant, like this one here in Berlin. While the water flows, Matthias Gerhardt and his colleagues check the chassis and refill the oil. For more thorough inspections, the locomotive must come here. The mining and steam locomotive works, the biggest maintenance and repair center for steam locomotives in Europe. 
This is also where the 18201 was built in the early 1960s. Udo Steinwasser is a mechanical engineer and an expert on the 18201. The 18201 was actually developed in order to have a steam locomotive that could go faster than 160 km per hour, in order to test high-speed train cars. The engineers assembled the 18201 largely out of parts from three old steam locomotives. They provided the chassis, the wheel sets and the outer cylinders. Only the boiler was a new construction. Why was the decision made to use a steam locomotive design? Very simple, because at that time steam locomotives made up over 90% of the fleet. A diesel locomotive would have required designing something brand new, and that was deemed too expensive. The 18201 must go to Meiningen every three years for its official inspection. It is disassembled entirely and all the parts, for example the giant wheels, are thoroughly checked. The real challenges lie in finding replacement parts, especially spoke wheels and other large elements or for the boiler. The 18201 is a one-of-a-kind and today there are no more spare parts for a one-of-a-kind machine of this size. Thus, spare parts for the locomotive must almost always be made according to the old construction plans. In the meantime, the 18201 has crossed the Polish border and is approaching its destination of Poznan. Even after 10 years, engineer Matthias Gerhardt is thrilled every time he drives this locomotive. It's like the Mercedes of steam locomotives. There are others that drive just as well, but, as I said, I'm fascinated by how smoothly it runs, considering it was designed without the use of computers. Thanks to its good driving performance, the locomotive continued to be used for regular rail operations far into the 1970s. After a journey of six hours, the 18201 reaches its destination. While the passengers go on a sightseeing tour, the engineers will prepare the world's fastest steam locomotive for the return trip to Germany. From a sooty steel monster to an elegant designer train, later in this episode, the most luxurious train in the world. For passengers, it is like a cruise ship on rails. Our next ultimate vehicle is not the fastest of fast trains, but it has the most modern drive design. The ICE-4. With nearly 13,500 horsepower, it is the most powerful intercity express of all time. With 830 seats, this train is meant to be the new backbone of long-distance rail transport in Germany. The new ICE-4 is almost 350 meters long and has 12 cars. When empty, it weighs 670 tons. Its high speed 250 kilometers an hour. The home station of this state-of-the-art train, Hamburg, Germany. Maintenance and repair take place here in Hamburg's Eidelstedt district. Mechanics, electronics, digital systems. Everything has been under special observation since trial operations began in October 2016. Fitters like Andreas Friedrich are specially trained to recognize the smallest problems and malfunctions in the new technology. We're checking the suspension system now and have to look for damage, visible damage on the exterior like flat spots, oily shock absorbers and broken springs. This is the air suspension, which provides greater comfort than the metal springs used in the ICE-1. Markus Peto works on Deutsche Bahn's flagship train. 
In the past, his job was called engineer. Today, he refers to himself as a driver. His cockpit is a cluster of computers. Without the most powerful and fastest computing capacity possible, nothing works in this giant of the rails. This is really special for me. I've worked on the railroad for over 25 years. My father was also an engineer. In 1991, he drove the first ICE from the 401 series. And now, 25 years later, I sat here and drove the first ICE-4 from the new series. All computers have been booted up. Let them know we're ready to pull out. It seems like a space station launch when Marcus Peto puts 13,500 horsepower in motion. Despite its power and size, the ICE-4 is about 120 tons lighter than the first ICE series. It makes you proud when you sit at the controls and perform operations, and you understand how the technology works, how the tractive force is unleashed to make it up the mountains. It's simply awesome. The ICE-4 contains several independent security mechanisms. They are active during the entire journey and monitor continuously the entire control system. The systems on board support the driver. They take a lot of pressure off him, making it possible for him to take care of other things, like keeping an eye on the tracks. But in the end, it is me, the driver, who takes action, and the train does what I say. The passengers are barely aware of the technology. Even in second class, they have comfortable seats and can store more luggage. For the first time, bicycles are also allowed on the ICE. With a reservation, eight spots are available. Leather in first class, and something special for families in an otherwise no-nonsense environment. The true innovation of the ICE-4 lies underneath the passengers. The drive system. Michael Brom was one of the train's designers. One of the cars with seats, where we are sitting now, is a locomotive that need not necessarily be at the head or the tail of the train, but rather somewhere in the middle. There are six locomotives hidden in this train. They are under the floors of the cars and no one notices them. Six of the ICE-4's 12 cars are outfitted with two so-called rotary drive frames each. Each of these six power cars is self-sufficient, being outfitted with the full technology of a locomotive. On the one hand, that means a kind of all-wheel drive. On the other, these locomotive cars can be added to or removed from the train at will. So trains on routes with large altitude differences get more power cars than trains that travel on flat routes. In addition, aluminium is no longer used. Workers are back to bending and welding steel. It's easier to work with. Nevertheless, the body has not become heavier, but rather lighter. The secret lies in the fabrication of especially rigid moldings. The bogies are also one-third lighter than on earlier ICEs. It took 10 years for the new train to hit the tracks. You feel a personal sense of achievement when the things you've long considered worked on and discussed in Excel tables and PowerPoint presentations suddenly become tangible, something you can touch, board, and ride, to see it every day and have it become normal for travelers to use. On a trial run, the ICE-4 travels from Hamburg to Munich and back. The first stop is the terminus station Hamburg-Altona. Here, Driver Marcus Peto must walk from one end of the train to the other in order to continue the journey. Backwards, so to speak. This small effort is followed by a reward. Now he is allowed to go full throttle. The ICE's high speed of 250 km an hour is deliberately lower than that of other high speed trains. To achieve a better energy balance and because it is barely worth it to drive faster in a country as densely populated as Germany. Still, something can always happen. But Marcus Peto is not worried. 
The train breaks automatically. So if I get sick, if I pass out, the train would immediately put on an emergency brake. It would stay on until the train stopped. Then the train would stand still while the employees from the back came up to see what was wrong, and then they'd deal with the situation. By 2023, 119 new ICE-4s should be driving on German tracks. The total cost, 5.3 billion euros. It will only be profitable if millions of future travelers also get on board this ultimate vehicle. Later in this episode, a train with unique cogwheel technology, designed to climb the steepest route in the world. From a high-speed train that deliberately foregoes top speed, to a train whose job is no longer to get anywhere fast. The Shikishima a five-star hotel in a cramped space. The showpiece of the Japanese railway company JR East. Pure luxury for the guests and hard work for the employees. The Shikishima completed its first journey on May 1st, 2017. Its 17 suites have room for a maximum of 34 guests. This exclusivity has its price. Tickets cost between 2,800 and 10,000 US dollars. Tokyo, Japan's capital. The luxury train is waiting to begin its next trip. It took six years to build the train. The development costs about 80 million dollars. For the general manager, Michiko Ozawa, it is a milestone in the history of train travel. In the past, trains were only used to get from one place to another. But the novel concept of this train is to enjoy the ride. It's not about speed anymore, but rather the experience itself. Like on a cruise ship, we also make stops and show the passengers the special features of each region. Shikishima means four seasons. And indeed, the luxury train's routes vary by season. The goal? to always present the most beautiful side of Japan. The challenge was to assemble the team. The design was developed by Ken Okayama. Great attention was paid to every detail of the interior design. For example, the wood is a special Japanese wood. The whole team worked very hard. Onboard service was also very important. We have a first-class chef. The railway company hopes the new luxury train will attract above all rich Japanese retirees, but also wealthy tourists. The Shikishima has 10 cars. Six of them have sleeper suites for the guests. There is also a lounge with a bar. and a restaurant in which star chefs work their magic. A special highlight, observation cars on both ends of the train. Today, the Shikishima will undertake one of its first test drives. The journey begins at the station in Ueno, a district in central Tokyo. Before the journey begins, the guests can relax in the newly built lounge. A total of 12 service personnel take care of the passengers. Kayo Tamura is one of them. This journey counts as a dress rehearsal for her. I'm definitely nervous, but this is still only a training exercise, and I'm really looking forward to working on this train. As the luxury train pulls in, a wave of excitement mounts. Today's guests consist of high-ranking employees of the railway company, journalists and actresses.
The Shikishima is already fully booked until March 2018. A lottery decides who gets a ticket. A concierge brings each passenger individually to his or her room. A maximum of 34 guests can travel on the luxury train. The atmosphere on this train can be compared to no other train. I was fascinated the moment I came on board for the first time. And the service on board is excellent. They make you feel at home. The 15 standard double rooms all have their own separate bathroom, even including a shower. 11.40, departure. The driver sits at the head of the train, separated from the passengers only by a pane of glass. The Shikishima is powered by an electro-diesel hybrid system the first in all of Japan. In addition to an electric engine, two diesel alternators located in the end cars make it possible to drive on both electrified and non-electrified tracks. The longest route takes passengers all the way to the northern island of Hokkaido and lasts four days. In total, three different round trips are offered. The goal, to spread tourism to remote regions. While the guests relax, steward Kayo Tamura does an inspection round. In the observation car, the passengers can watch Japan's landscape pass by. That's why the train only travels at a maximum speed of 100 kilometers per hour. I was excited the first time I boarded the train. It's so luxurious. Every little detail was carefully chosen. Every plate designed specially for the train. And everything comes from the regions we drive through. That really thrills me. It's time to get things ready for dinner. A five-course meal awaits the passengers in the dining car. The challenge of my job is that I not only work as a restaurant professional, but I must also be good in every other area, like mixing cocktails or making beds. If you work in a normal hotel, you only have one job. But on this train, I have to do everything. And it's difficult to do everything perfectly. A rolling five-star hotel. In the kitchen, a team of six people sees to the guests' gastronomic pleasure. The cramped space and the train's constant movements make cooking a true challenge for head chef Iwasaki Hitoshi. The menu was specially tailored to the conditions here on board. The train moves and so to keep everything from falling off the plate, I've made a thick sauce. I spread it on the plate and place the food on top. The dishes and ingredients come from the regions the train travels through on each tour. For train hostess Kayo Tamura, today's journey is only the second time she has worked on the Shikishima. This is my cheat sheet. I haven't been doing the job for very long, so I wrote down exactly what the dishes are called and what they contain. In an emergency, she can use a headset to contact her supervisor. While the guests wallow in luxury up above, Kayo Tamura shows us the break room for the service personnel. 
There's not much space, and it's very hot and humid. Honestly, it's not that nice to eat here, but we have to do it this way for the customers. It's okay, though. Everything for the good of the guests. After dinner, there is entertainment at the bar. In the meantime, Kayo Tamura takes care of the next task, making up one of the two deluxe suites. The young steward makes the beds under the watchful eye of a trainer. For three nights in this deluxe room, guests pay about 8,000 US dollars. In addition to a fireplace, the amenities even include a bathtub made of the finest cypress wood. The customers pay lots of money to travel on this train, so they expect a very high standard of service. I feel like I have to do everything perfectly. This luxuriousness is outdone only by the next room. A trip in the two-level suite costs another $1,000 on top. I've been working here for three months, and I want to do my best, satisfy the customers, and make them happy. I can't imagine doing anything else. I really like this job a lot. After 10 hours, Kayo Tamura's shift comes to an end. And while the guests sleep at night, the luxury train takes them to a new destination. The Shikishima, a peerless vehicle. Just like this iron ore train from South Africa, Later in this episode, the longest train in the world. Car after car for more than four kilometers. Like the last one, this next ultimate vehicle is known for neither its size nor its speed. Its speciality, ascending a mountain. It is the steepest cog railway in the world. The Pilatus Railway. Thanks to its unique cogwheel system, it handles grades no other train could. The railway was built in 1888. Over its 4.6-kilometer course, it climbs a gradient of up to 48%. Its high speed is 12 kilometers per hour. Its location, the Swiss Alps. The Pilatus rises to a height of over 2,100 meters. The bottom station is in Alpna, at the foot of the mountain. Christian Müller prepares for a test drive. In two days, the railway is scheduled to reopen after the winter break. We're checking the engines, making sure they don't overheat, and then the three brake systems. The so-called power car is train and locomotive all in one. A locomotive trailed by cars would be too heavy to make it up the extreme grade. There is room for up to 40 passengers in this special cog train. Then Christian Müller starts the 210 horsepower electric engine. An 18 gear transmission transfers the engine's power to the cog wheels. The many gears ensure an optimal transmission on the demanding route. The rails are original to 1888. Before the season opens, they are thoroughly inspected. An arduous task on the steep slope. Oh, 
Schrecken für die Frage. The Frenchen. tracks are free. We can go. Christian Müller always keeps an eye on the tracks. Driving up, we have to make sure the tracks are free and the overhead wires are clear of branches. Like the cars, the overhead line is also from 1936, when the railway was electrified. This is the first 48% grade. This is the first of three such sections. A 48% grade, almost twice as steep as every other stretch of railway in the world. That the Pilatus Railway can drive up even this grade safely and without a problem is thanks to its special cogwheel system. It consists of two cogwheels that engage the sides of a rack running between the rails. Safety discs under the cogwheels make sure that the wheels cannot jump out of the rack line. Thus, the train does not lose its grip even at the steepest points and cannot tip over backwards. The car is also specially designed for this demanding route. Much effort was put into keeping the construction light. On a 48% grade, every kilogram counts. After about 15 minutes, the train reaches the halfway station at an altitude of nearly 1,400 meters. The driver, Christian Müller, performs his first inspection. All of the machinery is underneath the car. That makes maintenance easier and creates more space for passengers. Everything looks good. Temperature's right, not too hot, no wear. Oil, engine, gearbox, it's all good. The cars were built at the Winterthur Locomotive and Machine Works, meanwhile bought up by Stadler Rail, one of the largest train manufacturers in the world. Urs Wieser worked at the Winterthur Locomotive Works and is responsible for cog railways at Stadler Rail and thus also for the Pilatus Railway. The Pilatus in Lucerne, on the other side, Mount Rigi. Getting up there was very attractive for tourism at the time. The Pilatus was much steeper, so something new had to be designed. Cable cars didn't exist yet, so it was an exciting task to build a railway up there. The Pilatus Railway's first cars were driven by steam. They brought nearly 50,000 passengers a year to the summit, an unexpected success. To increase capacity and meet the heavy demand, the railway was electrified in 1936 for over 1 million Swiss francs. It also received the new power cars, which are still used today. In the first year alone, these cars brought more than 100,000 people up the Pilatus. Even today, the Swiss train manufacturer regularly sells new cog trains. In contrast to the Pilatus Railway, however, they have only one cogwheel. The system with two cogwheels remained one of a kind, despite its success. It's an incredible accomplishment. All the things railway engineers invented in the late 19th century. Reckoning by hand, drawing by hand, everything done on paper with a ruler, no resources like we have today. No CAD, no calculation programs, and they had no test tracks. Only when the first train drove did you know if it worked or not. The engineers who built the Pilatus Railway did everything right. Christian Müller, the driver, has meanwhile almost completed his test drive. The railway is good. It's 80 years old now, and we're proud it's so dependable. There are few malfunctions or breakdowns. We're proud it runs so well and never lets us down. 
only about five minutes until the summit. But then... Sadly, this is the end of the line. I thought my colleagues had cleared more snow, but there's snow on the tracks ahead. They needed more time than I thought, so we have to go back. The masses of snow up here at about 2,000 meters are also the reason why the railway only operates in the summer. For the return journey, Christian Müller moves to the second camp. It's there because the car cannot turn around on the tracks. For safety reasons, the train descends at a maximum of only 9 km per hour. If it exceeds this speed, an automatic brake engages and stops the car. An important safety system. Christian Müller tests this brake now to end the test drive. We stop moving almost immediately. That's good. In the next six to seven months, the steepest cog railway in the world will bring more than half a million people to the summit of the Pilatus. From a small lightweight on the mountain to an extremely heavy train that stretches for kilometers. Six locomotives and 342 cars. The Sishan Saldana iron ore train is the longest train in the world. Being proud of this longest train, couldn't ask for more. This monster on rails has been operating since December 2007. It's a monster of a machine. Its maximum length is 4.2 kilometers. It transports over 34,000 tons of iron ore at a time over a distance of 861 kilometers. Zishan, in the middle of South Africa. This is the location of one of the world's biggest iron ore mines. Since 1953, over a billion tons of ore have been dug out. At the moment, more than 8,000 people work in this mine. 14 kilometers long and 400 meters deep. A single track rail stretches to the port in Saldana. The trip lasts 18 hours. A problem along the single track line can quickly bring freight traffic to a complete standstill. One locomotive alone is insufficient to pull the four kilometer monster. It requires at least five. The train is so long that it takes 15 minutes to drive by. Freight trains have run on the line from Sishan to Saldana Bay since 1976. Until 2007, the train's maximum length was 2.3 kilometers. Manager Sedik van der Skeve helped to design the longer trains. And the main reason for the line was to get the iron ore to the harbor as quick as possible. So we needed to get as much as we can, and that is how we designed the long train. The trains that leave the mine in Sishan, loaded with iron ore, have three individual sections. Each section typically consists of one electric locomotive, one diesel locomotive, and 114 iron ore cars. All three sections are ultimately joined together and then augmented by an additional electric locomotive at the end. At the moment, a train with four electric locomotives, two diesel locomotives and 342 iron ore cars is being prepared for departure. Responsible for coupling the sections, Christopher muller olwe He needs one and a half hours to check all the sections of the train. One wagon for coupling, half a wagon coupling. Enclosure now five meters for coupling. Three meters, half a meter. The challenge, the line to the coast is single track. If only one section of the train stops working, all the traffic comes to a standstill. One mistake can lead to a very big incident. The consequence, millions in expenses. The whole train is controlled by the first locomotive. This functions by means of a radio system 
RDP or radio distributed power. The driver sends a signal to accelerate or brake from the lead locomotive to the other locomotives via radio waves. And they send information, for example, about their speed back. If necessary, the lead locomotive is also able to send different commands to the individual locomotives. That means all commands come from the lead locomotive. In addition to the electric locomotives, the diesel ones have meanwhile also been upgraded with a radio system. What we have done now, we've also installed the DP radio, similar to RDP, to those locos now also, which are giving us a little bit more flexibility. Since 2016, it has been possible to place diesel locomotives at any point in the train if necessary, even as the lead locomotive. The primary responsibility lies with driver Paul Brandt Louvre. He alone controls the four kilometer long steel colossus until the midway point. There, he trades places with the driver of the empty returning train and drives it back to the mine. His greatest challenge, he must estimate the energy consumption properly. The fully loaded heavyweight consumes a great deal of electricity. It's very heavy, so I need to take a little bit more power than the guy on the empty train doesn't need much power. He can, I mean, he can be in motion at a very low notch or so, and he can still continue. But with, for, for me, I need that power in order to get the train, uh, keep it in motion. He must decide upon the right combination of electric and diesel consumption. In the worst case, the returning train receives no power at all. That means a standstill. The radio waves give him continual feedback. Thus, he has all the information he needs for his estimation. It's much easier to to handle the train, it's much easier to control the train. Constant monitoring is especially important for a train of this length. If the emergency brake is engaged, the Colossus would only come to a stop after two kilometers. But Paul Brand Louvre loves the challenge. He said, I can't change it for anything in the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's something that I can be proud of, that, or that I am proud of. I mean, being here and, as I said, I'm here for the love of the job. Only one driver is required to transport 34,000 tons of iron ore in one vehicle across South Africa.